At the North East CMA, we manage many different projects across biodiversity and threatened species in general. But whether you've got a really large project where you're putting thousands of seedlings into the ground, or whether you've got a small project where you're only putting 50 seedlings into the ground, the key to success is good planning. Proper planning ensures you'll get the best results and you'll also save time and money. Planning helps to set objectives, identify when tasks are to be done, and prioritises activities so that they're undertaken both when they're needed and when they're going to be most effective. You first of all need to understand what your motivations are for undertaking restoration and revegetation. Is it for the protection of your livestock and carbon sequestration? Is it to reduce erosion and protect the creek lines and drainage lines on your property? Is it to improve habitat quality and biodiversity for woodland birds such as what we've got under the Bush for Birds program? It could be a number of any of these objectives but understanding how these fit together on your property as a whole will help you to understand how to undertake planning and your revegetation project. If you've got a site that has rocky outcrops, when you're planning it's a good idea uh, not to plant too close to the rocky outcrops because they're habitat for a range of reptiles. And reptiles really like being able to soak up the sun, so it's a good idea not to crowd them out. At a landscape level, you might look at how revegetation can extend the benefits of a significant area of roadside vegetation or a reserve nearby. And by looking at a successful planting on a neighbouring property, you can add to their revegetation efforts on your own property. You might want to consider what threatened species are in the region and focus on creating habitat for them in the medium and longer term. Understanding the big picture and how your property fits in at a landscape level can also help increase opportunities for funding from agencies such as the North East CMA. Behind me you can see across the landscape we've put a corridor in here to connect the remnants to revegetation areas so we've got habitat continuity which is important for animals to move through. Often in areas like this, we've lost a lot of the diversity of native plants. Replacing those can be really key, for example, for many different bird species. Our honey eaters rely on nectar bearing shrubs and trees, and putting those components back really helps. It's really important to look at conservation in a, at a landscape level. It's the streamside remnants, the roadsides, and our reserve system in totality that provide the, the size of a resource that some of our threatened species need. Once you've worked out why you want to revegetate, you can then select a site where revegetation might be most needed or most appropriate. One of the tools that we can use when we're planning our revegetation, or indeed doing property planning, is to use uh, maps and aerial images of your sites. It's a really useful tool for um, planning things out and putting ideas down on paper. There's a range of uh, digital mapping systems now which uh, can give you a great planning ad advantage. Yeah, so a really great piece of free software that people like to use these days to plan their reveg is Google Earth. It's free and it's really effective and it's a simple way to plan out your revegetation project. You can add in new fences and then you can draw in shapes. Like say for instance if you want to plant a reveg block here you could make this an oblong shape and then you can double check how long your fence is going to be in this box here and it says that my fence is going to be 450 metres long. And you can see here for this particular block here, I've already planned out my reveg along my riparian section between these two dams I've got, but I might also add a new polygon and I'm going to call this paddock revegetation. So once you're happy with your plan, you can actually then print it off uh, Google Earth and it's really easy. You just click on this printing icon up the top of the screen and then you can call the map revegetation. Okay. And you can see here it gives it a title and there's a legend down the side here based on the polygons and lines that you've drawn in. So if you need to find out more about Google Earth and how to use it, there's plenty of tutorials available online and they'll be able to give you really great information about how to master Google Earth Pro. Once you've worked out why you want to revegetate, you then need to select a site where revegetation might be most needed or most appropriate. And once you've identified the site, you then need to consider the site's features and characteristics. These features will determine the plant species and the revegetation techniques required. 
Conducting a field or site assessment will really help you nail down what these features and characteristics of your site are. It's really important to keep large dead trees. These are often a source of uh, a roost, roost sites for raptors. They're often full of uh, bats and it's a really good idea if you've got large dead trees to, to retain them in your paddock context. A site assessment will consider the flora and fauna on your site, its soils and topography, land and water issues such as erosion, infrastructure above and below the ground like dams, easements, power lines and underground cables, and what the past and present management issues are on the site. There's a wide range of issues to consider that will dictate what you put back into the landscape and a site assessment will give you a really good base to consider further steps in your planning. So when you're thinking about planning your project, it's a great idea to get out and do a site assessment and have a look at that landscape. This is a good opportunity to get your local land care group involved because they have years of experience in your area and can help you with your planning. So when you've done your site assessment, you'll have a feel for the remnant vegetation on your property and what gaps you have that you're trying to fill. So whether it's shrubs or trees and in what sort of numbers, you'll have that concept come out of your site assessment. So when you've worked out what you need for your site, the first step is probably to get a revegetation guide to help guide the selection of plants for your local area. So the North East CMA website has all of our revegetation guides for our local area and choose the one that's relevant to your geographic location. That'll give you a mix of trees and shrubs that suit your locality. And then it's broken up further into zones. So whether you're on a hill slope or down on the creek, and it will give you a list of plants to suit that area. We're very fortunate that we've got a number of good local nurseries that grow our, our native indigenous plants for us. So head down there with your revegetation guide list and they can help put a selection of plants together for you. They'll break it into trees and shrubs, and it's a good idea to consider having a good mix of diversity, so a high number of species in your site. Certain species of plant are really important for birds such as Regen honey eaters. Winter flowering eucalypts are really key, and we can reintroduce those in our revegetation areas to expand the resources and the habitat area for species such as Regen honey eaters and swift parrots. Remnant vegetation gives us a model to use to plan our revegetation areas. There's a number of key features in bush which we're aiming to reproduce and reintroduce. Some of the key characteristics of remnant native vegetation that provide for biodiversity values are things like the structural diversity, the range of different plants you find on site, Different plants, different species provide different resources for wildlife to use. Native vegetation has a lot of structural diversity. Naturally, you have plants going through a whole range of different life cycles. And while we can't recreate that in a revegetation area, we can certainly introduce the plants and, and kick that process going. So depending on what your objectives are for your site, you may not need to set your site up with nice ordered rows. If you're doing a shelter belt, that is definitely the easiest way to plant. But if it's a site that where you're focusing on habitat and biodiversity, then a more natural planting will serve you much better. So really important to space out your trees. Now in the past, we might have planted our trees two to three metres apart. Now we're going eight, even 10 metres apart between trees to allow them to develop full canopies. And then what's also really important is to recreate that sort of patchiness that happens in the landscape naturally. So tight clumps of shrubs, like what you can see behind me, a really valuable habitat for birds. And leaving open grassy areas, it allows grass seed to come up and your seed eating birds will really love these patches here. So by planting a little bit more naturally, you create pockets that work for different, different species in the landscape. Depending on what you're trying to achieve for your site, the ratio of shrubs and trees might vary a bit. If you're planting a shelter belt and your prime consideration is a windbreak, then you'll have a higher number of shrubs through your site. If you're planting um, a biodiversity site, like enhancing a farm dam or planting around remnants, the ratio of shrubs and trees will be quite different as well. I think a general rule is possibly to go for around one to five, um, at most for the trees and make sure you space those trees out adequately through the site. 
If the proportion of trees is too high, the shrubs won't get the light and the moisture that they need to grow and they just won't establish well. So the trees will form the dominant canopy for your site, but when it comes to the shrubs, a lot of our native shrubs come in different height categories. So your medium shrubs fill that sort of two to five metre height range. And then there are the large shrubs or what we call our sub canopy trees, things like blackwood and lightwood that fill that maybe five to 10 metre height. So it's important to have a good spread of heights across your site because we know that birds, for instance, forage at specific heights. And so you do want a mix through the, through the project site. The other really important thing to consider is prickly shrubs because when we're talking birds, prickly shrubs are essential and planting those together in nice tight clumps is really valuable habitat. Once you know what species you're going to use and what spacing you're going to need, you can then work out how many plants you're going to require by doing some simple maths. If your spacing is 8 by 8 metres, then that's 64 square metres per seedling of space required. In one hectare, there are 10,000 square metres. So if you divide 10,000 by 64, that gives you about 150 to 160 trees per hectare to aim for. So in terms of long-term weed control for your site, that really begins at the planning and at the concept stage. So it's really important to know what you have before you put your fence up. If you have invasive grasses like Paspalum or Phalaris, then your weed control might need to start 12 months out before you're planting. You need to get on top of those species before the fence goes up. Otherwise, it's really down to either hand chipping or spot spraying weeds as they come up. And not all plants are going to become a problem once the fence goes up. It's important to know what you have before you start. Weed control is really the most important thing for the success of your revegetation because the weeds will not only take the moisture, they'll also take the light away. And weeds like this cooch grass, if, if it's not controlled properly beforehand, it will just smother the new tree and pinch all of the nutrients and, and the water from it, and the new tree will struggle and possibly die. Weed control after planting is really difficult. So when you're doing your planning for your site, you do need to think about what pest animals you have present that's going to influence your choice of guards for your site. It'll also influence the type of fence that you put up to manage them. If you've got hares and rabbits, control for those animals might need to start 12 months before you actually go and do your planting because they can wreak havoc in a site in a night. This particular fence was put up it's near a river, so two electric, two plain, quite simple, but it's this bottom hot wire that we had to put in to manage wallabies at this site and that has helped take the pressure off the reveg that was planted here originally. After you've, you've ordered your trees, then you start have to think about the fencing and the fencing materials. You've got autumn to do the fencing, summer and autumn, and often autumn's a better time. Late summer, you've got to think about the ripping when things are fairly dry, but you'll still get shattering of the soil. Then you'll be doing another weed control possibly a month or two prior to planting, but if you've had an autumn break, you'll get a lot of annual weeds coming up. So I need to control them. The timing of when you want to put the plants in the ground really depends on when you can get the plants from the nursery and when the, the weed control and the site's ready by June, July. It's a good time to, to plant during the winter because it gives the plants time to actually settle in before the temperatures in the soils warm up and the plants can take off. If you're planting late, such as mid to late spring, unless it's a wet year, you'll be planting your plants as the season becomes warmer and drier. This isn't really a good time to plant because it will increase the amount of watering that you have to do over summer and dramatically decrease the survival rate of your plants. With the variability in climate these days though, spring can be wet like it was back in 2021. So planting in August and September under a wetter climate scenario can be fine. It really comes down to how wet the season is because your plants have to stay moist over summer to survive. During a drought year, the main strategy is weed control, weed control, so any little moisture is there in the soil for the plant that you put in. And if there really isn't any moisture, then it's probably better off not to plant that year. You can plant and water the plant, but you might be watering every two weeks for four or five months. It might be easier not to plant on that year. And these days with weather forecasts, we can probably get a bit of an idea. The key to success with any good revegetation project really is good planning. Planning helps you to understand your motivations, set and prioritise tasks, and organise your resources for when they'll most be useful. To recap, 
Place as much emphasis as possible on your revegetation plan. Use Google Earth Pro or a similar tool to map out what you want to achieve. Undertake a site assessment using a representative from your local land care group to work out what natural features already exist and how you can build on them. Once you know what you have on your site, use our online revegetation guides to help plan out what species you will be using. Use your desired tree spacing to work out how many plants you're going to need. With weed control, go hard and go early. Get at least two rounds of weed control in before you plant, but allow for more, particularly if you have problem weeds like Phalaris or Puspalum on your site. Considering how you want to protect your revegetation from grazing animals such as livestock and wildlife is essential for short-term survival. A plain wire or electric fence is best. Aim to plant your plants over the winter season. July and August are usually the best months for this. Order your plants from the nursery at least 12 months in advance of when you aim to plant them. And remember that if you're planting in a dry year, you're going to need to allow time and resources for watering over the summer period in the first season after planting. And if you need any help with any of your planting, please don't hesitate to get in contact with the North East CMA or contact your local land care group. <music>